interesting time to start recording. There we go, on cue, and also a great time to also start our presentation that we have prepared for you all. So we'll let that go up in a moment. And as, as we get the presentation ready to share with you all, um, I just want to share on some community agreements with folks. Um, just because we're going to be together and it's always just good practice to have a general sense of what it means to be in solidarity with one another when we are in this sort of space. Um, so we are going to do that. Hopefully we um, get the agreements up so y'all can follow along. And I'm sure that we'll, we'll get to see those in a moment. Um, while we, um, we do that, we're just gonna go ahead, right? And just start by inviting you to be fully present um, in this space using as many ways to participate as you desire, right? Um, we kind of are used to Zoom at this point, but it's always good to um, really just go over some Zoom etiquette, right, for us. As a reminder, we're asking um, folks to stay muted, um, and at, during the times that we're not um, asking for folks to participate, um, but we do want you to participate using all of the uh, different features that um, you want to use. So for example, um, the, it's, the chat is a great place to participate. So you can, um, a lot of you already doing, introducing yourself, um, reactions, comments, questions, all of it. We, some of my colleagues are here, um, are going to be monitoring the chat, which is a great ministry. So thank you for everyone who is uh, providing Zoom hospitality. We do want to hear from you and we'll do our best to include your comments in the life of the event today as we, uh, as we can. So um, we also ask you to be kind and supportive of your fellow community members in the chat. Um, the chat is, like I mentioned, my colleagues are there for you. Um, folks that are ca causing disruption or acting against our shared values uh, will get a word from my colleagues. And, and if they don't resist, they will be removed from the Zoom call. From the Zoom call. So to that end, please be sure to mute yourself, like I mentioned, and remain muted throughout the session. So on that note of agreements, right? I have just a couple, and this is something that we will do every time that we are together. Um, we'll have a little reminder um, to engage in active and respectful listening. Um, we wanna make sure that we're listening to what people are sharing and creating a discussion, not a debate. So just pay attention to who has spoken and who has not. Ensure that you're listening as much as you are participating. Um, and, and a silence is always a welcome guest. So it's okay if we're just talking about something and there is a little bit of silence, we we'll just let that silence, silence be. Um, the second one I love is, uh, I, I used to have a good friend that said, when in doubt, turn to wonder, right? So choose curiosity. Um, so when in doubt, turn to wonder means that when we choose curiosity rather than criticism, we really build bridges um, instead of barriers. So if someone expresses an opinion that is different or even opposed to yours within the space, right? Of course, in a respectful matter, turn to curiosity, ask questions, um, and just be generally open and interest, avoiding judgment and seeking to learn more will surely make of a, a more wholesome community for sure. Um, the third one is, uh, we are all experts of experience, right? Um, we celebrate your expertise on your own experience, and we ask that you extend the same generosity to others. Um, our voices are equally weighted and welcome. Um, we can move to the next ones and the next page. 
Um, and we always remind folks to practice mutual respect, right? We wanna give the same respect to others as we expect from them. Um, and this is definitely the next one, a big one for me, and is that L is for liberatory language. At CFC, we're incredibly intentional with the language that we use, uh, making sure that it reflects and respects the goodness of all of God's creation. So you will hear us use very particular language. Um, so for example, we encourage people to share their pronouns so we can address them using their correct pronouns. And another example uh, that I have for you all is that when we talk about um, different uh, experiences, we always say women and people who can get pregnant to refer to the spectrum of identities uh, of folks. So the chat, uh, it is a great place to participate um, and it is not a good place to start debates around the language we use. I invite you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me if you have any additional questions. I am your organizer, so I'm here exactly for that. Um, so if you have any questions or concerns, um, please reach out. The Calendly for my um, schedule, schedule will be shared with you all. Um, so lastly, share the miracle and not the saints. We wanna feel confident that participants will not share the personal experiences or our relations of others. So while we encourage you to share what we, we have learned, um, if, if someone, especially as we go into small groups, um, we ask that, you know, you ask folks before sharing some of what they share. So share the miracle and not the saint or check in with the saint first. And with that, um, that's kind of our uh, list of agreements. Are we good? Can I see some enthusiastic consent from folks that we're good to go. Amazing. I see, I see some folks. Um, so it is with so much joy that I want to introduce you all to um, Catholics for Choice president. Um, Jamie Manson is going to be um, have it, uh, blessing our time together and will also be sharing some content with us. So Jamie, welcome. We're so glad and grateful for your leadership. So go ahead. Bless us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steph. And I want to say Steph wrote this lovely prayer for us that I'm going to read. God of all seasons, this evening as summer transforms into fall, we ask that we too might be transformed by this time to learn together as a community. We ask that your spirit of wisdom walk with us opening our hearts to encounter that is possible when God's beloveds gather in the name of justice. We pray this through Jesus, who frequently gathered with his disciples to teach and to learn. Amen. And welcome again, everyone. I'm absolutely thrilled that you're here. Um, and this is an exciting day for us. We are, we are uh, boldly embarking on a whole new venture uh, for Catholics for Choice, which turns 50, by the way, next year. And so it's an exciting moment um, in, in, in what is a uh, obviously very, very painful time for the reproductive rights movement. And we're just so glad that you are here. So we'll begin our first Bible study lesson uh, on making the Catholic case for supporting abortion access. We are going to start with what we call the three pillars of pro-choice Catholicism, conscience, religious freedom, and social justice. We will briefly highlight the first two, and then we'll, we'll do a deeper dive into the third one, social justice. So let's start by talking about conscience and make sure that my, my program here is working right. There we go, okay. So in Catholic teaching, conscience, it said, is the final arbiter, the final judge in any moral decision we make. And by that, we mean our individual conscience. We call this the primacy of conscience. As Catholics, we believe that we must use all resources available to form our consciences, not just the thoughts of bishops and priests in the pulpit, but so many different uh, avenues to form our consciences so that we can make the best possible decisions for ourselves, for our families, especially in morally complex circumstances. Conscience in includes the knowledge of ourselves, awareness of our own moral principles, and the urge to act. We regard conscience as a gift and a responsibility. We're called to follow our conscience and respect the rights of others to do the same. 
So conscience has a very, very rich history in the Catholic tradition. Um, it is Latin for conscientia, which is the attempt to be true to one's highest ideals. In the Catholic tradition, conscience is a link between human rationality, this wonderful gift that God gives us, this gift of reason, and human freedom, another gift that God gives us. St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the most influential theologians in the history of the church, a doctor of the church, addressed questions uh, in his many, many writings about what, what happens when conscience conflicts, when our individual conscience conflicts with the law. And so what Thomas said was, acting against your individual conscience is always a sin because it means second guessing your own human capacity for freedom of choice. To deny your conscience would be in a sense to deny your own human dignity. And these ideas that we, that, that what Thomas has said and what we opened up saying about the primacy of conscience is very much held up in the catechism. This is what the catechism has to say. Conscience is a judgment of reason whereby the human person recognizes the moral quality of a concrete act that they are going to perform, are in the process of performing, or have already completed. In all that they say and do, the human person is obliged to follow faithfully what they know to be just and right. That's right out of, right out of the, the catechism of the Catholic Church. We did change that language to be inclusive. To, in the, if you look it up in the catechism, it will say he and man. Um, but we are an inclusive group. And so um, the two most important parts of that statement are the judgments of conscience are based in human reason and that we should always follow our conscience. Now, our second pillar, religious freedom, really comes out of our fundamental understanding of conscience, which is that God gives us the gift of reason to make decisions. And those decisions must be honored as part of our human dignity. So religious freedom wasn't a, a major topic in most of church history, but it got rediscovered um, in during Vatican II, um, when so many things were being reevaluated and those doors were being, uh, windows were being opened in the church. And in, in the teaching on uh, the dignity of the human person, Vatican II calls for the freedom of each person to choose their religion or no religion at all. Good Catholic teaching respects religious pluralism, respects the separation of church and state. And according to the US Constitution, when we talk about religious freedom, what the Constitution is saying there is that freedom of religion means not only the freedom to practice your religion or your beliefs, but the freedom to be free of the beliefs of others. That's the piece that's often left in this conversation around religious freedom. And, and we see it playing out. The anti-choice movement is trying to enshrine into law the theological beliefs, some of them extremely fringe, of one particular religious group. And that is a violation of the religious freedom of other people of faith, such as Jews, Muslims, mainline Protestants, and not to mention those who do not subscribe or do not affiliate with a religious belief. Their rights are being infringed upon when these fringe religious ideas are being codified into law. And the Catholic Church has spent years, over a decade, trying to redefine what religious liberty means. They're pursuing religious freedom protections for large institutions at, at the expense of individuals, such as the right to ex access contraception, the, the, um, the exemptions they have tried to carve out or have successfully carved out in things like the Affordable Care Act. And so when they do that, when the hierarchy pushes to do that, they're actually really violating good Catholic teaching, which again honors religious pluralism and honors the separation of church and state. So let's dive now into social justice, the third pillar. Um, and as we dive into that, what I'd like to do first is introduce you to another framework called uh, reproductive justice. I mean, here's, a, here's an excellent graphic that sort of encompasses the reproductive justice framework very well. You deserve to parent your child without fear that he or she will be hurt or killed. Freedom from violence is reproductive justice. So how did this reproductive justice framework come about? It happened in 1994. Um, there were 12 Black women in attendance um, when the Clinton administration was attempting to create a plan for universal health care. 
And as they were listening to the, the, the talking during this conference, much of which was being done by white people, they began to question the assumptions that were being made by those who were developing this health care plan and whether they were really able to represent the needs of black women and black people. Their core concern, these 12 black women, was that when a person gets pregnant, whether planned or unplanned, many social justice issues become urgent. It's not just about abortion rights, workers' rights, domestic violence, immigration status, environmental care, access to education, the right to health care and child care. All these are all social justice issues that suddenly become urgent. And they felt that listening to the Clinton administration talk about the health care plan, those were not being reflected. So they created their own framework that we now call reproductive justice. Um, and they called it that because it interweaves both reproductive justice and social justice, these two frameworks. And the reproductive justice framework has three main tenets. One is the right to have a child. The other is the right to not have a child. And the third one that was added later was the right to nurture children in safe and healthy environments. It takes up this, 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 this framework takes abortion beyond that, that rights framework that was very much a product of, of white women and brings abortion out of that realm of choice and into questions about access that consider all of these other social justice issues. There's a wonderful um, write up uh, in the National Black Women's Reproductive Justice Agenda that is, um, you can see it on the website of In Our Own Voice, which is an RJ organization. Wonderful definition of reproduct reproductive justice. It means the human right to control our sexuality, our gender, our work, and our reproduction. That right can only be achieved when all women and girls have the complete economic, social, and political power and resources to make healthy decisions about our bodies, our families, in our communities in all areas of our lives. It's an excellent, a, a beautiful encapsulation of what reproductive justice is. This was written before we had more awareness about gender and gender diversity and the presence of non-binary people and transgender people. If this were rewritten today, it would of course be much more gender inclusive in its language, but nevertheless an excellent encapsulation of what the reproductive justice framework is. So, Let's, thinking about the reproductive justice framework, let's take a look at now the Catholic social justice framework. It has seven main principles, core principles, and they have very deep mutual strengths about them. The intersections are incredible. Both Catholic social justice and reproductive justice call us to consider the whole person in all issues of policy and morality. And it asks us to look at people through the totality of their lived experience, because we don't live one issue lives. Um, can reproductive justice be a Catholic social justice value? We at Catholics for Choice absolutely think it can be and should be, because reproductive justice centers the most marginalized people in our society, which is a core value of Catholic social justice. And both share this fundamental belief that all people deserve access to economic, social, and political resources to make family planning decisions. These, these are fundamental ideas that stem out of the Catholic understanding of human dignity and human freedom, as well as the, the reproductive justice framework has the same values. So let's go through those seven principles of Catholic social justice. You go through them quickly. First one is the call to family, community, and participation in the common good. And what the Catholic Church teaches it is that every person has a distinct right to participate in family and community where all can pursue the common good. If we cannot build a society where all people can thrive together in community, we cannot have justice. And the call to community and participation in pursuit of the common good means building a society where all voices are heard. These are fundamental reproductive justice values as well. Rights and responsibilities, second principle of Catholic social justice, which is the right to access all fundamental things required to lead a dignified life, basic needs, food, water, shelter, health care. And this is something reproductive justice absolutely agrees with. The decision to have children, reproductive justice framework says, is profoundly impacted by whether or not you can, your life circumstances allow you access to these fundamental things. 
option for the poor and vulnerable. This is one of the crown jewels of Catholic social justice. And what it says is we must prioritize people who are in poverty, who are sick, who are subjected to situations of powerlessness, who are marginalized or made vulnerable by, by governments and social systems. In reproductive justice would remind you that in the US, 75% of abortion patients are low income and 50% are below the poverty line. Our work to improve reproductive health care must not further stigmatize people who, are, who choose abortion, especially for people in poverty. Because what we know is abortion bans and restrictions, restrictions disproportionately impact people who are trying to make ends meet, who are sick, who are in rural areas, who are otherwise marginalized because of racism or gender inequity uh, or horrific immigration policies that are in this, this country. So again, a shared core value. Um, it's possible someone has their, their mic on. I just, just check your mic. I'm hearing some background noise. So just want to double check that, please. Thanks. Um, the dignity of work and the rights of workers. We must fight for rights and better working conditions. This is a, this is a, a Catholic justice value that goes back to 1873 with the fir very first Catholic uh, social justice encyclical. This right to rest, this right to be supported when someone is unable to work and the right to good a just wage and good work that honors one's dignity. Um, there is a moral obligation to provide comprehensive health care, pay parental leave, and free child care. Does the Catholic Church teach this? Yes. To all dioceses that employ people honor it? No, not so much. But these are fundamental reproductive justice values. And this is what RJ would say. The ability to safely and secure, securely raise a child is essential to create flourishing in families and communities. Solidarity, great Catholic phrase we hear from liberation the theologians. A radical commitment to bearing the burdens of those who are suffering. John Paul II, who was not pro-choice, obviously, had a, had a profound idea that really resonates with reproductive justice. He said, solidarity is not a feeling of vague compassion or shallow distress at the misfortunes of others, both near and far. It is a firm and preserving determination to commit oneself to the common good. That is to say, to the good of all and of each individual, because we really are responsible for each other. And this is, RJ would point out that abortion bans and restrictions cause that disproportionate suffering to those who are already facing all different forms of oppression. So we need to be in solidarity with these people so they can have access. Care for our common home. This has been a very big um, value uh, by Pope Francis, um, wrote a whole encyclical about it. Um, and uh, so what it says basically is that Catholic social justice recognizes the inherent connection between all living things. We seek to put ourselves in right relationship with the land, which includes protecting the earth from existential threat of climate change. Um, this was beautifully, beautifully said by the Pope um, in Laudato Si. Um, and this is a fundamental value RJ would agree with. The fight for environmental justice is essential to ensure that people can parent their children in safe and sustainable communities. We're called to care for the earth so our communities can thrive. So now that we have a grasp on, on reproductive justice and Catholic social justice frameworks, let's talk about why these abortion bans and restrictions create such a violation of basic social justice principles. I want to introduce you, if you haven't already read it or are not aware of it, to a book called The Turnaway Study. It was published by Diana Foster Green in 2020. Uh, Green offered, interviewed 1,000 women every six months for five years. She recruited the, from 30 clinics across the country, and over 8,000 interviews were conducted. And what she was studying, Diana Foster, um, Foster Green, was the impact on women who have been denied a wanted abortion and the impact on those who did receive the care they wanted. To our knowledge, um, and to I've talked to uh, Diana about this, everyone identified as a woman, so we will use the, lang the language of women um, to, to reflect the book. Top findings about the denials of care. This is what she, she discovered. It creates economic hardship and insecurity, which lasts for years. Those who cannot get an access to a wanted abortion are more likely to be financially insecure and living in poverty years later, along with their children. They're more likely to stay in contact with a violent partner, and they're more likely to raise the resulting child alone. 
Their financial being and development of children is negatively impacted. They have more serious health problems than if they would have than if they'd had an abortion. They're more likely to have trouble bonding with their baby. There's a very sad statistic that the, a significant number don't even feel joy when their baby smiles. Their existing children tend to have worse developmental and economic outcomes. And those who were denied abortion care report more anxiety, higher stress, and much worse self-esteem in the short term. Diana also studied those who did get access to a wanted abortion. And so what she found was they, those who received access were more financially stable, set more ambitious goals, raised children under more stable conditions, and have no short or long-term emotional or mental health consequences. And most interestingly, they are more likely to want a child later and are better able to take care of that child, of the children they have. 95% of women, this is a very important statistic, who received a wanted abortion, later reported it was the right decision for them. That's a very important statistic because there are a lot of anti-choice folks, particularly in the Catholic Church, who make a claim about abortion doing profound damage to people who choose it, and the statistics simply don't hold up. I want to share this, this quote um, that Diana Green Foster said. It's not that they don't realize there are moral questions involved, but they're weighing their whole life responsibilities and plans to decide and decide that this is the right decision for them. It's an important line, I think, because it 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 accepts that this is a morally complex issue for people. And, and the people who do choose abortion, for many of them, it was complicated. Not for everyone, for some, some it is an easier decision for others, for some, some it's a happy decision. But the point is they take into account the totality of their lives when they make this decision. I wanna share one more thought. Um, about the, something that Diana Green Foster, she was interviewed on Fresh Air back in 2020 um, on NPR. And she, she said something that I think is so powerful because we talk a lot in, in the rights framework about bodily autonomy and not that that's not an important thing to be able to make decisions freely for yourself, but there is so much more. The, the totality of the person um, has to be taken into account. So what she said was there's so much more at stake than just women's bodily autonomy and the well-being of a fetus who will become a baby. It's not just about her body, but her whole life trajectory, her chance of having a wanted baby later, her chance of having a good positive romantic relationship, and her chance of supporting herself and her family. It affects her existing children, and the well-being of your future children. And so I just love that quote because it just it talks about, you know, that this is a whole life's journey has to be weighed when this decision is made. Um, this study is essential um, for all of us, especially when we think about the social justice consequences of abortion bans and restrictions. And this and the study is essential because abortion is incredibly common in the United States. Um, so here are some statistics about that. Abortion is normal. Abortion is ordinary. Every year, 6.4 million U.S. women get pregnant. Half of those pregnancies are unplanned. 50 to 60 percent of them were using contraceptives when they got pregnant during that month. 40% of unplanned pregnancies end in abortion. Of people who get abortions, 39% are white, 28% are black, and 25% are Hispanic. And a, a statistic that's really important to us at Catholics for Choice, nearly one in four abortion patients in the United States identifies as Catholic. 61% of abortion patients have already had at least one child. So 61% of them are already parents. And approximately one in three US women will have an abortion by age 45. So again, it's extraordinarily ordinary and that's why we have to reckon with these issues. Some new theolog theologians have been thinking about new frameworks for how to think about abortion. Um, I think given where we're at, we're at right now in this moment where we have lost Roe, uh, it is important that we think about new approaches and think about new frameworks. And we have to think of a new framework because the framework we always think about it in is a justification framework. 
It requires people to justify their choice. And it might misidentifies the termination of pregnancy as the starting point for ethical discernment. It reduces what is a moral complex issue into a binary right or wrong. And so what theologians are saying now is we have to change the questions. Good ethics always changes the questions. And the starting point should be that pregnant person's life, not the choice, not the pregnancy's and starting point. The pregnant person's life has to be the starting point. And if you listen to a lot of anti-choice rhetoric, you will hear a they will completely ignore or dismiss the value of the life of the person carrying the child. There's always this, this, this focus in on the fetus that, that just erases the identity, the life, the trajectory of the person bearing the child. And they reduce them to vessels, um, one in which the potential theoretical life is privileged over the living and breathing person at risk. Now, again, you know, even in this moment, there are people who are very frustrated with, with the, the, the fight over abortion, especially people of faith. They see it as very polarized. They see both sides as extreme. And some many people of faith have said to me, I feel that I don't feel like I'm pro-life or pro-choice. I don't feel like those, those categories are adequate for describing my beliefs about abortion. And so we it's important to remember that this binary way of looking at things, this justification framework is the product of a, of a, of a post-row right-wing white anti-feminist Christian thought. That is where that is who has defined this framework for us. So we need to have a whole new framework. And some Catholic women have been working on this for years. Um, a line that uh, 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 it's more than a line, but here it is. Sister Joan Chittister has this quote that really resonates with a lot of people. And she says, just because you're opposed to abortion doesn't, doesn't make you pro-life. In fact, I think in many cases, your morality is deeply lacking if all you want is a child born, but not a child fed, not a child educated, not a child housed. Why would, you, why would I think that you don't? Because you don't want any tax money to go there. That's not pro-life, that's pro-birth. And we need a much broader conversation on what the morality of pro-life is. So Sister Joan is expressing an interest in a deeper debate about what it means socially and politically to say we support life and children. Because the fact is our most anti-choice politicians consistently vote against things that would benefit the lives of parents, of mothers, of children. Um, whether it's a gun control issue or it's um, it's it's you know a poverty an anti-poverty bill or a child nutrition bill, they consistently vote against these things that would better promote life, particularly of children and families. Francis Kissling, who was my predecessor at Catholics for Choice, um, said that the fetus is more visible than ever before, and the abortion rights movement needs to accept its existence and value. It may not have the right to life, but ending the life of a fetus is not morally insignificant. And so what Frances is saying is she too wants a more meaningful discussion about the moral status of the fetus, since she believes that the pro-choice movement sometimes has come off as having no regard and has failed to com com communicate better with the movable middle. This was a very challenging thing when she said it 20 years ago, um, but I think that losing Roe uh, as we have sort of invites us to think more deeply about what she was saying here. And that we do have, the, the relationship to the fetus is, is complicated uh, because we all have different experiences of pregnancy and of abortion and of gestation. And so trying to, to find where we can acknowledge that value without erasing the, 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 this, the importance of the person who is bearing the child, the person who is pregnant. These ideas were really well developed in a book by Rebecca Todd Peters. It's called Trust Women. Um, and what, what Peters says is what we need is a new moral language that expresses the complexity of pregnant bodies, of liminal spaces, and the moral status of what she calls the prenate. She doesn't use the word fetus or baby because she thinks it constrains the moral imagination of what happens over nine months. She said we need a theology of gestation. Um, we need to think about what what it is what that experience is in a wanted pregnancy. Um, 
some people experience gestating as an intersubjective experience, that there is a co-creative relationship between, between the person who is carrying the child and the fetus. But that experience is not universal. Many factors affect how one interprets that relationship uh, between the childbearer and the prenate. She said, we should think about the prenate as a human becoming rather than the human being, since being presumes a level of consciousness that simply cannot exist after birth. Ultimately, what she wants to say is trust, trust pregnant people. She talks about the childbearer and the prenate living in a liminal space. And she says this notion of liminality offers a framework where we can recognize the moral status of the fetus as intrinsically valuable. This is what Francis Kissling is talking about for its potential for life without reifying it into an existing or actual life, without making something that is abstract concrete. And that is what's happening in the anti-choice movement with these notions of fetal personhood. We have the social construction of fetal personhood that is erasing women and is erasing pregnant people. Ultimately, the question is, do we trust? Do we trust women? Do we trust pregnant people as capable of being moral agents? And if we do, that creates that, that opens up that space for ethical discernment. And it opens up that possibility for seeing abortion as a moral good. I'll stop there. Um, I give you a lot of information. Um, and I'm very, very happy to say that this won't simply be a lecture, but that Stephanie now um, will, will pivot and actually uh, work, work together with us on some practical applications of what we have to say. All of this information is in your Advocates Bible, um, so you can review it there. And we'll also, of course, you can review, review this, this video later. So Stephanie, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, so much for that. Um, that was so rich. So if you all just take a deep breath with me as we let that just settle in, sink in, um, definitely resonate with so many of the things that that Jamie shared. Um, my uh, colleagues can also add to the chat what were some of the pages that we uh, that Jamie um, so brilliantly discussed with us today because this is all in our Advocates Bible here. Um, so we're going to um, take a moment right to transition into a little bit of a more uh, applied practical exercise um, and in each one of these sessions we're going to be hearing from folks discussing and kind of talking about the content of the amazing advocate bible and then we're going to chat a little bit about um, how do we take this right how do we use this um, and how do we apply this particularly as we build a movement for reproductive rights and justice that is uh catholic rooted right um so that's exactly what we're going to be doing today we're going to uh talk about um how do we engage other for choice catholics um, and uh, before we do that, I think it's important to just like ground and why do we organize, right? Uh, a couple of months ago, we gathered as a community right after the decision, uh, the Supreme Court decision, and, and we chatted about why do we organize? And we organize to create and build the power that we need to change the conditions of those most affected by this issue, by the lack of reproductive rights and justice. And Jamie outlined who are those people very, very well. Um, so we're here at Catholics for Choice. We're organizing to encounter. We want to build an abundant base for pro-choice Catholics and other people of faith who support reproductive rights and justice. So it's time for us to show right, that we are the pro-choice Catholic majority. Um, and we're also organizing to educate. Uh, and that is why we're all here. And that's why we're so excited about the Advocates Bible. We are also organized to embolden folks. So we want to make sure that those people that we encounter, those people that we are in the in the collaborative process of, of education with and that of learning with are also have the skills that they need to go and take action. Um, so that's why we organize. And we'll come back to that as we 
many times as we need as we come to kind of center. So like I mentioned, as part of these studies, we will be learning important skills to effectively organize as a community of virtuous Catholics, um, which is, it's so exciting, right? Um, this particular evening, we were going to attempt to answer the following questions in the time that we have remaining. What is uh, base building? Uh, why should we spend our precious time and energy base building? And who should be doing base building? And base building, it, it's like I mentioned, a very, very important part of organizing folks. It might be at the very center of our work um, as organizers. So like I said, what is base building? Who should be, why will we spend our time base building and who should be base building? Um, so before jumping into anything, I want to offer a kind of a definition, a place to start when it comes to what is base building. One of my favorite authors, Alicia Garza, is also one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement and a really fantastic, brilliant movement builder, defines base building as the long-term process of directly impacted people and their allies coming together for the practice of taking collective action to change specific material conditions and or shift narratives. So I'm gonna say that again, to change specific material conditions and or shift narratives. So the definition is there and I'm wondering if one or two folks wanna share in the chat what, um, what kind of like, what caught your attention from this definition of base building? So the long-term process that directly impacted folks, long-term, amazing, Carol. That is one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we highlighted. This is a long-term process. Um, as we think about our opposition, and we're going to be really taking a deep dive into the opposition next um, session, um, they've had a really fantastic, like successful uh, long-term plan, right? Uh, the moment we did not arrive uh, the last summer in a moment, right? That took a lot of planning. And I really wanted to make sure that we think about this work as long-term work as well. So thank you so much. Um, I'm changing narratives, centers that people affected, directly impacted people, collected action. There is so much richness here. Right, so we want to make sure that we're highlighting those parts of this definition that speak to us. Definitions are always like an invitation, right? And we can add and edit and just think about um, this as we go, but that is an offering, right, to us today as we think about what is space building and why are we taking this time as a community to really uh, talk about it. There are uh, two examples of base building that I wanna offer you both, and we can see those here in this slide. The first one is outreach. The work of visualizing, advertising, the work of an organization or group with the purpose of recruiting others to join. And this is examples here, right? Like we've all seen this, I'm sure tabling at an event, passing flyers after church. I've done that for many years. Making an announcement during coffee hour. There, We have all seen outreach at some point in our lives. Um, and it's very much part of the church as well. So outreach is an example of base building. And the second example that I want to offer to us this evening is recruitment. So we have outreach and then we have recruitment. This is a little bit more specific, right? Because it's the process of meeting people assessing their potential to get involved, and this is going to be particularly relevant for us today, and recording their contact information. An example of that is turnout. You all are here, right? Um, and we're so grateful that you're here. So this is, we were all recruited to be here this evening. So we had, we shared the information, we've got emails, uh, we hopefully send you the Advocates Bible study and you received it. Um, so we shared some of our information in order to be here sharing um, as well. So those are two examples of um, base building as well. So um, as we think about base building, right, 
I think it's super important that I uh, say a word about this is not easy part of the work. I think like a lot of folks, as we think about long-term, and that's why we're doing some of it together, right? This is uh, challenging for some people. I am someone, and that's why I'm an organizer. I love talking to strangers, love passing flyers, love asking people for their phone number so I can give them a call and remind them to show up at the Advocates Bible Study. That is something that I feel super comfortable with, but I totally understand that not everyone is in a situation where they feel like that's something that they can do, inviting others and like asking for them to join something can take a little bit of vulnerability. Um, so I'm gonna recognize that. And if this feels like, ooh, that's hard work, like totally is lean into that. And the reason why we uh, wanna do this and it's important is because like I mentioned, we want to continue to build a movement that is large, right? Numbers are important because we want to, going back to the definition of organizing, want to make change and make the change the material conditions of those affected by this issue. So just wanted to make space for everyone, whether you feel comfortable or not with the work of base building, it's always good to be honest and be, you know, real about, um, some of the difficulties of this work. If that resonates, um, I totally get it. So here we have a, an example. It's an unfortunate one, but it's an example. Um, this is the Washington Post, and this is the, the reporting of the March for Life um, for 2021. Um, and here we read, uh, so the event uh, has long been the country's largest anti-abortion rally. Organizers expect a reduced attendance this year because of the coronavirus pandemic. In their permit applications or application, organizers estimated 50,000 people will attend the March for Life. A small number of abortion right activists protest the rally each year, but March for Life organizers don't expect a large crowd of counter protesters this week. A hard pill to swallow, but they were they permitted they fill out a permit for fifty thousand people. So I would love to hear from you all. What does the number of people attending this rally tell you about this group's base building abilities? Like, what do you sense from that? They have a dedicated base. Yes. They're organized. Yes. All of those things. They're deep into their community. Absolutely. Um, they're unfortunately effective. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, all of those things are very accurate, right? And that's why we're here building skills so we can also uh, continue to build a movement of pro choice Catholics. Um, so yeah, all the churches are well connected to other institutions. They're very, very good with like, when we say that churches organize trips, that's really good institution organizing, right? They talk to people that are already organized in their churches and they bring them in buses, right? So all of your assessments are just right on point, right? And um, they are, uh, expecting the large numbers of people. And that is definitely how you create an impact and you create change. So that is, as, as much as it's a, a little bit of a challenging thing to know, it's good that we are aware, right? That um, we are definitely, that this is uh, the reality of the opposition that we're facing. Um, so thank you all for those really great reflections. Um, again, going back to the book, The Purpose of Power, Alicia Garza writes, no base, no movement. And I have, I like, that might be one of the quotes that I like to, I say that at night all day, no base, no movement, right? We need the people, right? And in order to uh, recruit other folks, and I, I get your emails, I get your emails, and like, we um, 
uh, I, what I hear from you all is that we want to meet people in your region. We want to talk to other pro-choice Catholics in your area, right? Um, and we know that it's an important part of the work ahead, and we want to definitely be um, building a base, continuing to build a base. Um, so not something that we're doing here, right? That's something that we've been doing and we're doing it because we understand and I know you all understand it's an important part of what we're trying to accomplish. So we're going to practice, we're gonna do a little exercise um, about like um, very common in organizing is called network uh, mapping. But before we do that, um, we wanna make sure that we, also address the question, who should be doing base building? So we said, what is base building? We got that. We talked about what is it? Who should be doing it? Like it takes all of us, right? Um, it really does take all of us. So I want to hear from you all, how you feel about uh, recruiting other people, how comfortable you feel inviting others. So we're going to have a little Zoom poll. And if you have used Zoom polls before, just like click the answer that best fit you and how you feel. And the question is, how do you feel about inviting others um, to join Catholics for Choice? So I'm getting the result. A lot of people feel great about it. A lot of medium. Absolutely. I totally get that. And a lot of folks who are newbies but are excited to learn. Wow, we have like a tie here between I feel great, bring it on, and I feel medium, I have concerns. And like I said at the very beginning, it's totally um, normal, right, to, you know, have that, like, itchy feeling about inviting others. Um, amazing. So thank you, folks, for it's good to know how we feel, we'll get a temperature check of the room. Um, so we are going to do something that is called network mapping, and we're going to jump into it now because we know that our time time is passing by. So I'm gonna invite you, this is the time uh, that we need our pen and paper. Um, and I'm also going to invite my amazing colleague, CFC uh, Policy Director, Shannon, who is going to help us do this. Um, do this. So Shannon, can... Um, yep, I got it. Amazing. Thank you so much. So folks, this is a great time. Even if those folks who feel medium about it, like let's go through the exercise and see how you feel at the end of it. Okay. So we'll just be curious. This is a great time to lean into that curiosity that we were talking about in our agreements. So Shannon, are you ready with a pen and a paper? I'm I mean, ready. I'm amazing. I mean, I'm just pointing in the Bible because of, like I said, great, great space here. Great writing, note-taking, real estate at the first page. Um, so the first step, and we're going to do several steps, and I will try to do uh, and try to speak as slowly. You always feel free to ask questions in the chat um, that we'll do our best to um, answer. Okay. So you see here um, a little circle, right? And the first step, that you're going to do with your pen and paper is that, I mean, I'm a fan of deep breaths, so take a deep breath, right? This is about you and about your networks and about the communities that you belong to. Um, so add your name in the middle of this map. So make a little circle like it's there and um, add your name at the very middle. And you can see my example here, Steph, middle, there, Shannon with a bright Sharpie so we can all see it in the middle, your name, and that is step one. Can I see some kind of like thumbs up? We're good to move to next step two? Amazing. So think about what communities are you part of? That is like, what networks do you belong to, right? So in the next slide, we can see an example of the networks and the communities that I belong to. So when I was doing this exercise, I thought about, um, I belong to a church, actually two. So I have like a church congregation. And um, if we can go to the next slide, so the people can see 
the amazing. Thank you. So if you see a church emoji there, I, I'm part of a church community. Um, I'm also part of the Catholics for Choice community. Um, another example, I went to seminary, I went to divinity schools. So I'm part of that like alumni network of folks that have friends who are part of that, that are clergy. That is another example of another network and community that are part of. And I have uh, friends from college um, and that is a group that I am also part of. So I attended the University of Puerto Rico and I have uh, some old friends. Um, it's not here and I meant to add it, but I also, um, my husband and I are very connected to the Society of Jesus, to the Jesuits are kind of another group, another community of people that we are part of. So those are a couple of examples. If you can think about two or three or one even, just like list, like name those communities. So where do you belong to? Shannon, can you tell me a little bit about your map? Of course I can. So um, I have a few that are similar to Steph's in that I also work at Catholics for Choice. So you can see CFC staff here um, and I have my friends um, and I went to law school. So I have a network of fellow law school graduates um, that I can reach out to. Um, in addition, my family, I have a big pro-choice Catholic family in Pennsylvania, um, and I know that they would love to be involved in this work. And I also have a network of people that I've volunteered with since high school, and we still volunteer together here in DC. So there are also people I can reach out to. Thank you, Shannon. That is a great example. Um, before we move into step number three, um, I want to say a word about people that are already organized, right? So I am part as, as well, Shannon and some of my colleagues here, we're part of the Catholics for Choice uh, community. You all are, are here. We're part of the Catholic Choice community. That is us, right? So if for recruitment purposes, right, I am not going to recruit a person. I'm not going to try to recruit Shannon because Shannon is very well recruited already. And Shannon is not going to recruit me, right? Because I'm recruited. We're here. We're doing it. We're part of this movement. We want to think about, and I will invite you now to think about where are some communities where you think you can find some um, like-minded people, right? And those are the communities that we're going to explore. A lot of you, when we have the one-on-ones, we joke that we kind of wish there was a secret handshake, right? Where you will know in your parish and your community that those are pro-choice Catholics, that you will have some sort of like secret Batman thing to know, right? But because that doesn't exist, right? We need to make informed guesses about where in our communities we either know that we have like-minded people or we have a good informed guess that that is a good person to recruit, right? Because you have had some sort of conversation with them. So we're gonna move on to step number three. So step number one, you thought about yourself, right? You put your name down, done. Step number two, you reflected about what communities you're part of, and we're going to do step number three. For step number three, from those communities that you listed, right? Think about one that you think that like-minded folks will be so commit to commit to one of those communities who are specific members of that community i'm going to say that again right um you have listed hopefully two to three communities um i want to ask myself where is it more likely that i can find like-minded people that might be interested in joining catholics for choice and being part of this movement right so for me, in my example, as we can see in the next slide, I chose my church community, right? And in that church community, I'm thinking about very specific people, right? So once you commit to one of those communities, you can either add another circle and just start over again, or you can just start making, you know, lines from that, right? Do your thing, be creative. Um, Think about where are some folks that um, you think you, you know, can invite. Um, so here, um, like I said, I'm looking at my church community and I specifically thought about Lisa, 
Anna, Tammy, and Tom, and because they're part of my social justice committee, right? So they're part, uh, it's a good overlap. They're part of my congregation and they're with me in their social justice community. So think about specific folks in your life and name them there. Uh, Shannon, can you tell me about what, what you did? Absolutely. So I took a look at my law school alumni network and I thought of people who were like-minded that took similar classes like social justice and the law, people who I, I trust and I know a lot about and also people who have unique skills that they can help us out with as a movement. So I identified some of my law school friends, George, Grace, Sid, and Anna. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shannon. So from the four people that I uh, brainstormed, right, the last step is to just choose one or two people that you think you will be the most comfortable sharing information about CFC and inviting them to join the movement. So I, like I said, you can see it there. I thought about Lisa, Anna, Cami, and Tom. They're all very socially justice minded, right? But I also know that I ran into Lisa and Anna in a conference of, around women's rights, right? So I have a, a and we've had different conversations. Therefore, um, I think that the, they're great folks for me to reach out to and invite to join um, the movement because there are some intersecting um, interests there. Um, Shannon, from those folks that you um, kind of brainstorm, I'm I'm thinking about Anna and Cami. Who are you thinking about? I think that I'm thinking about Grace and Anna because I know that they actually do a lot of pro bono work um, and they help out and they help write amicus briefs or friend of the court briefs that support um, litigation against abortion bans and restrictions. So I know that they would love to be involved in this work in another way too. Awesome. I hope it's not the same Anna. I don't think it's the same Anna. <laughs> I don't think my friend Anna is a lawyer. Um, so, but who knows? People, you know, live their entire lives. Um, that's amazing. Thank you, Shannon, so much. So that was our last step. So by now, hopefully you thought about maybe one or two people that you can like um, um, invite to join Catholics for Choice. So I want to hear like in the chat, maybe one or two folks that want to share how was the exercise? Do you got stuck in a partic like particular step um, before uh, we move on to the next um, part of this exercise? Were you able to complete it? Did you reflect it about your communities? Yeah, day spring. This will help hold me accountable for sure because we have the names there. Great, awesome. So there were some um, some ideas flowing, um, and right, we will have this recorded for you all as well, and we will send this. So if there is any step that you kind of got, you know, kind of a little bit stuck, or if you want to think and reflect and pray a little bit about it, right? We like this is a great exercise to kind of realize that we we are. Uh, people of community and that we already probably have folks in our circles um, that we can invite to join this movement, right? No base, no movement. Um, therefore, and I will be repeating that until forever. So you'll hear me say that many, many more times into the future. Um, and also so many people want to be encountered by us. And I, for those folks, right, that feel a little bit like this is hard, right? Um, I invite you to think about like we at Catholics for Choice want to encounter and we want to educate and we want to embolden and that that encountering part is key. Folks really, really want to be encountered 
um, and invited and being part of this amazing, amazing community. Um, so I'm just looking at the time. We were hoping to do a uh, little breakout rooms for folks to reflect about how this exercise went. Um, but I think we're we're running a little bit of time, so we're going to uh, skip that for today. Um, and because we are going to skip that for today, perhaps this is a great time for one of you. Uh oh, did I got frozen? Do you all hear me? We hear you. Okay, great. I got scared for a moment. Um, amazing. So. Wanting, can I get like one person? Like I, I saw a lot of folks in the chat that want to like raise their hand and kind of tell us a little bit about like how was this uh, process? I see Lane. How was this for you, Lane? You want to share briefly? Hello, I'm Lane. I am a student at the University of Notre Dame. Oh yeah, hi Lane. Um, and I um, do a lot of activism on our campus, lots of organizing um, through our student government, but I'm required to stay in a pretty bipartisan role. So it is sometimes really difficult for me. Um, so some of the different groups that I kind of spewed off of was my student government, finding different people in my cabinet and having those individual conversations with them rather than having them in a very like large scale and on behalf of the University of Notre Dame student government. Um, so those individual connections would be super helpful. I thought about my work within campus ministry. I'm a lector, usher, and basilica at the Sacred Heart here on campus, um, finding different people within that group. Um, and then we do have Irish Reproductive Health, um, which is this really great nonprofit that is not officially recognized by the university because of its strong Catholic mission. But does a lot of organizing in the South Bend community, does a lot of organizing um, for like contraceptive access on campus, but again, not through the official Notre Dame um, sponsored avenues, but just through kind of like word of mouth, um, social media advertising. So getting a lot of Irish Rift of Health um, people on board, obviously we attend a Catholic university, so bringing some of them in, um, and they're obviously all for reproductive health and reproductive justice access for women and people who be can become pregnant. So my main ones for campus ministry circles and Irish reproductive health, um, which I'm really excited to work on this semester. Amazing. Thank you, Lane, so much. And I think there are some of your colleagues that are here as well. So um, fantastic. So we um, we got you in terms of like, uh, the folks you might be thinking, okay, so I got this person or I have this two people that I act that I think that I um, can reach out to specifically, right? And this is a great invitation. I, I talk to a lot of you and you really want to connect with folks that are in your region, that are in Florida, that are in like Indiana, that are in Ohio. So this is a great time to connect with those folks. And we are going to send you a template um, email. Uh, you can also adjust into a text because we got you and we really want you to invite others. And just for some quick math, for this Advocates Bible study, we had 575 people that expressed interest in joining us and, and registered for this, right? So folks are going to get the reporting. If we do the math and everyone that participates here can reach out to someone and recruit a person or two. We are many, many, many. So that is a very, very exciting potential in terms of like no base, no movement. We want to build that base. Um, therefore, with a couple, we only have a couple of more minutes together. So I just want to wrap up um, our time uh, with so much gratitude and also thinking about um, what's next for us, right? Um, there are two communications, two emails that I want you all to expect. Um, one is a follow-up email from today, right? We're going to do a follow-up action. And for each and every uh, Advocates Bible study session, we will have a follow-up action for you all to on your own time do. And surprise, surprise, this week's follow-up action is to send an email or two 
um, to those folks that you identify during the network mapping exercise. And like I mentioned in that email, in that follow-up email, you will receive a template that you can copy paste and you can edit and adjust as you see fit. Um, one of the things that um, we asked you all to reflect about prior to today is was the sentence, I am a pro-choice Catholic or I am just a pro-choice person, dot, dot, dot. So if you got the time to do that, that email, it's a great, great time to share with those uh, that you know, why are you here, right? What is your interest? What is your um, kind of like passion for this? What moves you? Therefore, you know, great place to share if you want. If not, we're like mentioned, we have an email that you can personalize and send um, to those folks uh, and you will get that for that follow-up email. Additional to that follow-up email, you will also get an email with the information about our next session. It's going to be on the roots of the anti-choice movement. So we will be taking a deep dive into the opposition. It's super important work that we must know, and we, but we in the practice session, we're also going to be talking about one-on-ones, why should we have them, and what is a one-on-one, and all of those good things as well. So we have a really fun upcoming session two um, of the Advocates Bible study, and in the meantime, you can always reach out with questions um, that you might have the very, very last thing that we're going to do is that we're going to share the link to a commitment card. So if you're already like fired up and you know who you're talking to, like Dayspring said, this will like this exercise will keep you accountable, keep me accountable for sure. So we have a link for you to complete, kind of let us know how is the exercise. If you have someone in mind that you want to reach out to, um, and any way that we can support you um, continue to build a base of pro choice Catholics. So that Shannon shared with us the link for that form. And yes, we are on um, time. It's been a joy to be in community with you all this evening. Um, if you are in the DC area, I don't want to let you all go without an invitation. Um, we are going to have a special green mass on October 2nd, um, and we will share more details about what that is, and you can RSVP um, in a link that my colleagues are also going to share. So if you're in the area, this is an opportunity for an in-person gathering. And yeah, just click the link and you will get more info as um, there as well. So a joy to be in community with you all. Thank you for participating in session number one. And we have three more sessions to look forward to. It's been a great, great, great pleasure and joy to be with you all. And I really hope you have a fantastic rest of your evening, folks. Take good care.